a little bit about what a virtual switch is. Uh, basically, it's a software module that runs on a server node and it enables network services for uh, virtual machines or containers, VNFs in general. Uh, so basically what that means is you, get east, you can get east-west, using a virtual switch, you can get east-west tra traffic, that's the traffic between virtual machines, and uh, north-south traffic, so traffic from the virtual machine to the physical network and back the other way. And more advanced and sophisticated virtual switches enable other kinds of network services. So for example, uh, they may do tunnel termination on the host, so you may send in VX LAN, LAN traffic and the virtual switch would decapsulate it and send the decapsulated traffic up into the virtual machine. Careful of that. And uh, it also does things like quality of service. So you maybe you can rate limit traffic going into a virtual machine or coming out of a virtual thing and things like that. And generally there's some kind of controller aspect to it. So you're able to control the virtual switch or a group of virtual switches using something like OpenFlow, for example. Uh, so OVS is one example of a virtual switch. It's probably the most widely deployed open source virtual switch, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And it's interesting for this, this crowd because very recently, about a year ago, some um, DBDK was integrated into OpenV switch. And it's made me think over the last couple of months, and uh, there's a question I've had for myself, and I think this is actually a good audience to ask that question, is I think it's probably the first example of a pretty large open source project that's integrated DBDK. Is that true? Or are there other examples? There is at least one. There is a competition uh, from the uh, transfer networks. Ah, okay. So there's another example. Uh, yeah. e either way, I think there's very few that ha have done this so far. And it's interesting because I don't think OVS users actually know about DBDK or understand how to use it. And I also, uh, probably a lot of the users don't even want to use DBDK. All they really want is really, really fast packet pro processing performance, and they don't really care how it happens. They'd rather it worked just like OVS. So what I'm going to do first, my section is talking about the architecture of OVS, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how it's evolved from its initial implementation through the, the, the years to now to the point where we've integrated um, DBDK acceleration into the uh, virtual switch. So. At the very start, uh, or first of all, Open vSwitch is an OpenFlow compliant switch, which means that you can program the switch um, and program this OpenFlow packet processing pipeline uh, using a controller. And the very initial versions were actually all in kernel space. Uh, so the whole thing was done down here in kernel space. And that was great, but there is a lot of disadvantages to working in kernel space that a lot of this community know. So for example, the performance wasn't great. Um, it's very difficult to develop in kernel space. You dereference a, a pointer a null pointer and you have to walk across the building to reset your board. And also it's difficult to upstream changes into the kernel or you'd have to maintain an out-of-tree driver. So what the, the community did is they, they split the architecture between user space and kernel space. And that's good because you can still, you still have an OpenFlow compliant switch, so using a controller you can still um, program your OpenFlow packet processing pipeline through user space. Um, but you only, and you only maintain a small uh, portion of the switch in kernel space, which is this microflow cache. Uh, the microflow cache is basically uh, an exact match uh, table. So it just look, it extracts uh, some fields from the packet, it uh, gets a hash of them, and then it just uh, looks up the table to figure out what to do with the packet. So the, the flow for uh, packets that arrive in, in this architecture is that they, they arrive, they see if there's any, uh, the microflow cache holds basically recently used flow. So they see if there's any entry in the flow table for a recently used flow. And if there's not, it makes what's called an up call uh, via the netlink layer up into user space, which in incurs the penalty of a context switch. And then it will traverse the packet processing pipeline in user space to figure out what to do with the packet. Uh, once it's decided what to do with the packet, it then does that thing with the packet, and then it'll install a flow in this microflow cache. So the subsequent packets that come into the cache um, <coughs> can get handled um, by, that, by that table. Uh, the, one of the issues with this is the cost for setting up a flow is actually quite expensive because you have to make this context switch from kernel space to user space. And the guys in the community came up with a lot of different ideas of how to improve the performance in this case. So they would do things like batch up calls together. So you'd amortize the cost of uh, the context switch across the number of up calls. Um, they also introduce you know, more, more threads in user space, so you could have more threads handling these up, up calls in parallel, and that helped improve the performance of the flow setup time. However, it's still quite expensive. Um, so what they did in version 1.11, which was probably about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, 
is they introduced something called a Megaflow cache to help improve the performance. So a Megaflow cache is, is, is actually a wildcard classifier in the kernel data path instead of the Microflow cache, which would have been an exact match classifier. And the advantage of this is with a wildcard classifier, each entry can match on more packets because a single entry you can wildcard certain fields and then many flows will match in that single entry and won't have to traverse this Netlink um, interface up into user space and incur the, the penalty of uh, the context switch. So that really helped to, well, it, it's a good way to improve performance. However, as Constantine, I think is somewhere at the back here, knows implementing uh, wildcard classifiers and ACLs in software is quite expensive. Um, so what they had to do then is they also had this microflow cache as well underneath the megaflow cache to help improve the performance. But generally that gave better performance, particularly in the presence of a lot of new flows getting set up. So, uh, yeah, in parallel to this, uh, well, actually one other thing I want to point out is in OpenVSwitch, um, the microflow cache is called the EMC or the exact match cache. Uh, Kevin will talk about it a little bit later. The megaflow cache is uh, implemented, it's called the data path classifier. And then um, up here you have the OF proto layer which does the, the packet processing. So that's kind of relevant for something that Kevin's talking about later on. So in parallel to that, um, Intel decided that they wanted to show that you know, packet processing in software, or sorry, in user space using DBDK, you can get really, really good performance as everyone in this room knows. So what we did is we forked OVS and we, um, we, we, have a, we, we created a POC that basically moved all this stuff into user space and used DBDK to show excellent performance. And that was quite successful. We got some very good promising results in terms of throughput and latency. Uh, and that helped encourage uh, or influence the Open vSwitch community to then accept these changes into the upstream. So now in the upstream, you can get a user space data path. It was always there. There was always a user space data path in OVS. It was just poor performance and not really well maintained. So now you can get this user space data path. They push it all up here. They use DBDK, they use pull mode uh, devices, and you can get really, really good performance. So uh, that was uh, quite, quite a good thing. So if we, delve, if we look into the architecture in a little bit more detail, and uh, we'll see how that is achieved. Um, so this is more a, a structural um, representation of the, the code in OVS. There's kind of three main components. Um, so you have OF Proto, NetDev, and DPIF. So NetDev uh, represents network devices, and uh, DPIF represents uh, open, uh, open vSwitch data path, and an open vSwitch data path is basically a wildcard table, an ACL table, with a load of ports uh, associated with it. And then OF Proto, which represents an open flow switch, and then OF Proto will use NetDev, NetDevs and DPIFs to then represent uh, the data path as an open flow switch, and then your management interface, which could be open flow, or OVSDB, which is a management interface, um, a proprietary one created by the Open vSwitch community, could then control that and configure your switch in, in many different ways. Each of these components um, has a, an interface, a very well-defined uh, internal interface, and you can uh, write your own implementation for this interface if you want, for these interfaces, if you want to port it to your own technology. Uh, so, for example, you could write an implementation of your OF Proto in, in, uh, interface to port it to a piece of hardware, as an example. And also within the code, uh, there's, there are a few implementations already there. So, for example, the DPIF interface has two implementations. There's DPIF NetLink, which is the kernel space data path, and DPIF NetDev, which is the user space data path. Uh, similarly, for NetDev, there's a number of different implementations of the NetDev interface. NetDev Linux for Linux interfaces, and NetDev DBDK for DBDK type interfaces. So Open vSwitch with DBDK is basically Open vSwitch using the, the DPIF NetDev for the DPIF um, interface, and NetDev DBDK for the NetDev uh, interface. Within NetDev DBDK, uh, it uses libDBDK directly, and it takes advantage of the different types of interfaces that are available in uh, DBDK. So ring, interfa ring interfaces, vhost interfaces, and physical NIC interfaces like the pole mode driver. Currently, that's really the only place we're using DBDK directly. 
I think we would like to see um, DBDK used directly, for example, in the DPIF um, code, maybe using you know, the hash table or the ACL table or something like that directly. But currently we only use it here. However, we do make software optimizations in a similar, vein, a similar kind of optimizations that DBDK community make. We do make them also in uh, different proportions of the code. Um, and actually, as a bit of a side point, um, the Intel fork of, of OVS created a different DPIF, so it was DPIF DBDK. So that was the, the, the different architecture between OVS with DBDK and the Intel fork of OVS. So if I delve into a little bit more detail about the different interfaces, I think maybe a lot of people here will be familiar with this, but I'll, I'll talk about it anyway. Um, there's three main interfaces, as I mentioned, in OVS with DBDK. There's the Pomo driver interface, which allows you to uh, read and write to physical mix. Uh, there's a ring interface, which uses shared memory and the RT ring um, APIs in DBDK to allow OPS to talk to uh, another process, be that a secondary process running in the host or another process or a, a process running in a virtual machine. And the advantages of that are it gives very high throughput, low latency, zero copy. Uh, the disadvantages uh, are that it, you know, for live migrations, it's a little bit difficult because you're, you know, mapping memory. Um, and also, there, there's some security issues with it in its current implementation because uh, you're sharing a big bunch of memory between virtual machines and potentially there are different customers, so there, there could, could be potentially some issues there. Another interface that's, that's been implemented is VertIO vHost. And VertIO, um, basically what that does, is it's a, a mechanism for communicate, it's a QMU standard mechanism um, for communicating into um, virtual machines based on QEMU. Uh, how that works is it presents a, a, a device, an emulated device in the QEMU, a VertIO device, and then within the QEMU virtual mach machine, you can attach a Linux network driver to that, um, that device and use you know, standard Linux tools like IP, and you can use standard uh, network sockets if you want to communicate with it, or you can use the Verdeo pull mode driver, which works like any pull mode driver, except it's working on this emulated device. And then in the back end of QEMU and the host, uh, vHost then communicates with, with the virtual switch. Uh, we have a user space vHost implementation, obviously, because our switch is in user space. There is a kernel one as well. And there's two flavors of that at the moment. So there's vHost queues, which was Intel's initial implementation of a user space vHost. Um, implementation, and also vHost user, which is the QEMU standard way of uh, doing vHost. So that's really a summary of the architecture, so I'm going to hand it on to, um, to Tom here, who's going to talk a little bit about usability of uh, OBS. So um, I've been at the pub while uh, um, Mark was speaking, and uh, now I'm back. Uh, <laughs> So, what, what, actually what I want to talk about is the perspective, kind of from an OVS user. And, and when we mean usability, first of all, I want to, um, uh, I want to discuss it, what, what we mean by user. You know, who actually uses OVS? And translate it, that into what advantages, disadvantages, frustrations, lack of frustrations. Um, there might be with these people as uh, uh, as using DPDK is exposed to them, but in addition, I want to talk about the whole the, the whole idea and the evolution of of DPDK not in of itself but DPDK as a component in in uh, OVS. Talk about the advantages and disadvantages of DPDK, and I'm going to tell a little user story from the perspective of someone, maybe basically me, who started working with DPDK as a, as a software engineer and, a, and someone's just trying to make things work and accelerate our, our traffic for a particular application. And then finally, we're going to talk about how we can improve DPK a little bit, uh, a little bit into the future. So like we've, like we've heard earlier, DPDK is probably, there are other alternate data planes besides the Linux data plane and OVS, but DPDK is the main one. And maybe someone else knows of other accelerated data planes. But the main one really, the most popular one is DPDK. 
And there's also um, the, the NetDev inter interface that Mark spoke of. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit too and in a different way and how that uh, enables the, uh, the, to make basically the use of DPDK to a large degree with, with some warts are essentially invisible to the users of OVS. So again, these use the the DPDK is is uh, great. We we can uh, forward packets blindingly fast, as we all know, especially for small packets, and enables the use of commodity hardware. So we can cut the um, the, the cost of of um, the OPEX or KP. I'm not a business guy, so I always get OPEX and KPEX confused because I don't have an MBA. But anyway, it, cut, it cuts the cost. Um, the, the recurring cost, and uh, it also allows the use of DPDK, allows the use of, um, allows the use of uh, basic, oh, the basic open flow switch functions are transparent and should work pretty much the same way in DPDK they do with OBS. And of course, the advantages of, of DPDK with respect to Linux is it's fast. When, when deployed properly, it's almost guaranteed to be faster. Even if you, even if you configure it not unintelligently, it'll still be almost, it, there's a couple of cases where I've seen it be slower with VHOS, coups, and so on. But, but generally, it's, it's, uh, it, 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 it's a real advantage. Um, but on the other hand, Linux, the advantage of Linux uh, data plane is, is it's familiar. Um, its device um, paradigm is familiar to people. It has rich debugging tools, uh, the ability to, to dump packets. Uh, there's a, just about any interface in Linux you can forward a packet to. Um, and of course, you have all, a, a wider variety of tunnel endpoints available, which really are sort of there, but not quite there sometimes in DPDK yet. And uh, uh, most but not least, or least but not most, uh, is the full set of device statistics are available. And that's a little bit abbreviated in, in DPDK, and a full set of metadata for, for the devices are carried through and made, made visible. And on the other hand, the DPDK's main advantage is it's just fast. It's mainly, and th th this is the, again, I'm talking about the advantages from the standpoint of someone using OVS. So what about, who are these users? As I said, they're, they're basically controllers uh, of open flow controllers, you know, open, open daylight, um, you know, Ryu, what, what have you, various other controllers. And also the uh, implementers, the OVS DB protocol like Oven, is a big one, or the OVSDB plugin for Open Daylight that basically manages the um, provisioning of ports and bridges uh, within OVS, as well as programming the flows. And they all, uh, hopefully, can, um, in many cases, can be set up in such a way that the fact that we're using DPDK is invisible, except for that it's faster. Or at least that's our ideal. We don't always achieve it. Another user, of course, is the people using the OVS CLI, like OF Cuddle and, and, and its uh, companions that you can configure a switch and look at all the things that are happening in the switch if you log in into the, into the uh, VM or the, the physical um, uh, server that's actually running OVS. And they can pretty much do the same thing with DPDK that they can do with, with uh, the Linux kernel. Of course, cloud, whoops, there's a misspelling, sorry. There are cloud deployers, uh, programmers, uh, people writing uh, applications on top of it, our, our users in effect. And we, we would like them to have a fairly simple interface so they don't have to know too much about the gory details of the underlying architecture, enough to optimize. I mean, many programmers are, are um, quite familiar these days with uh, thread pinning and how to optimize multi-threaded programs. They understand, they understand uh, some concepts of multi-core, but some of the cache coherency issues is, is, is difficult for a lot of people just not familiar. And it would be nice somehow if we don't have to expose all those things to all the people using OVS. 
Uh, so uh, then I'm also going to talk about um, break in the middle here to talk about a, a user a user's experience, and then finally um, we'll talk about what really do users want and their expect expectations of DPDK OVS. And this is kind of based on gleaning of conversations with uh, postings onto. Um, uh, you know, the OVS mailing list and so on, and hopefully we can stimulate some controversial discussion which will wake us all up. And so in the beginning, I, the user I'm going to talk about is me, so, because um, that's one person I know, and in, uh, I think, sometimes I'm not sure, but in, in 2013, um, I, I, at the ONS conference, I saw a, an Intel presentation. I said, wow, this is blindingly fast. And I was working at the time on security applications, and there's all this talk about, you know, the different things we could do with different very, very expensive um, front ends with um, very, very expensive uh, uh, silicon and and uh, FPCAs to capture packets extremely fast. And maybe we could go at 10 gig, 100 gig. In the security community, they didn't mind so much throwing tens of thousands of extra dollars on a box in order to capture packets for analysis for, like for example, to train machine learning and things like that. And then I, I was asked to uh, work on a, on a team developing a product that uh, was, an, uh, was a threat analyzer that was trying to find a price point that was way below the competition. Now, they currently had a plan. We had a prototype running on the OVF's Linux kernel, and it was great for doing DPI and analysis at one gig rates, and we proved that. But we didn't have a path going forward to 10 gig without, without breaking the price point for sales. Whoops. And in spite of all my training on this, I'm still hitting the wrong button. So what the idea was, uh, I said, hey, I think we could use this DPDK, and we don't have to buy uh, an expensive front end. We can just use the standard PMD interfaces, and we can go at optical rates. And they say, well, can you prove it? Well, I don't know. So uh, uh, was DPDK the answer? And so they wanted to, 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 to build a strategy around this looking forward. So I started out with DPDK 171, and I had already been familiar with OVS. I'd been using that for a year or two, and uh, open flow programming and so on. So that was it. And then I had integrated OVS with Linux kernel into the box. And, this, and, the, it, and then things started to get very confusing for, for someone. Uh, we had the, 171 integration, which really wasn't quite integrated with OVS. We, uh, we had the, the, the 01.org fork, the, um, which Mark might know something about, and uh, which showed you that it could work. Well, we had to integrate this with an application. We had to integrate it with a DPI path, and we also had to be able to remotely manage just the flow of packets for traffic shape, shaping and and uh, threat blocking and mitigation and things like that in our, at least in our plan, even if we weren't doing them currently. So, and then the third thing was the DPI fork that was done by Cosmos and that had a, a custom interface and I mean, just, Frank and I were just chatting about that a little while ago, that had a custom interface for, uh, for uh, the Cosmos's DPI engine but it didn't really give us a, a good way of going forward of managing the flows ourselves. And, and also, it wasn't quite, um, it wasn't quite uh, integrated yet with, uh, it, it didn't seem to be, it was a fork, it, it didn't look like it was uh, um, going to be accepted as a, uh, an addition to o open flow, and, to, and it would have been better to just work with interfaces. So what happened with 1.8 1 came along, and then everything just kind of fell together. Um, with 1.8, we were able to, um, uh, using the master branch at least, but without the, the, you know, the release code for OVS, was able to get DPDK working. I was able to demonstrate performance improvements without hardware, because they wouldn't give me any hardware. So I, I was able to, to I used, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, I hope there aren't any red hatters listening in here. 
I used VMX Net 3 because that's what I had, and it, it, uh, it worked well as a pull mode driver. So I put uh, DPDK in a VM, and I was able to swap out VMs, one with the Linux kernel, one with DPDK, and, gen and use some packet generators, and showed a 2.5 performance advantage. And so uh, this was without a lot of tuning. It was just using two cores. And I said, um, doing simple forwarding. So it really looked promising, you know, and, and they said, okay, good, this will be our future. Um, and, uh, and, they, and it looked very, very, very good. So uh, the next thing I did is I wrote a, a simple, um, uh, some simple code basically to, to uh, replace the PCAP layer in the DPI engine with uh, DPDK ring and got that more or less working. It wasn't great, it wasn't tuned properly, the thread, uh, the thread um, pinging and usage in the, in the DPI engine wasn't quite aligned with what was going on in the, in the, in the DPDK, but we, we saw that we could do it, and main thing is we had a device that we could forward packets to if we wanted them to be analyzed by DPI, by using the DPDKR, um, DPDKR interface in open vSwitch. In other words, the um, it, since since it, was, it was done in DPDK, and DPDK had, as, as Mark pointed out, an interface type, DPDK-R, that, that was basically a device that we could manage through OVS and forward traffic through. So it worked out quite well. Now we're up to 2.1, and pretty darn close to 2.2. So a lot has happened in the last, uh, and this, uh, this was work that uh, we did, I did, um, and others did toward the end of 2014, the beginning of 2015, actually, so it really wasn't that long ago. So a lot of it, and I'm going to kind of blast through this because I think um, Mark probably covered it better than, than I am, but the, the really thing that makes it transparent, and uh, Mark talked about the DPIF, but also it's the net dev that really makes a device a device. So OVS doesn't really know, in a lot of ways, whether or care <laughs> whether the device is implemented by one data plane or another. And this allows the tr the, what I call the transparency, the data planes, it allows um, the NetDev interface allows uh, the Linux data plane to behave very much like the DPDK data plane or, heaven forbid in this community, the Windows data plane, which I think is the third one that's received a lot of, a lot of attention, but that really it's help to expose for OVS developers a really generic and very robust um, uh, data plane to, um, to user space. Uh, well, is, they call it user space, but what they really mean is that o OF, uh, proto, OF proto part of, of OVS. So the, the NetDev is very similar to the network driver interface in BSD, as anybody who wrote drivers, and it's a little bit like uh, Linux kernel in the sense that it abstracts the details of the device. It has a start, a stop function, has queue management, and then tacked on the end is a private area that the devices can use. So it's, it's similar in concept um, to, it, to, to DPDK, and what that makes so is that the architecture gives you the transparency and gives you a nice layered approach. I want to say that coming from a, a networking standpoint and kind of an, I'm sort of a developer, but I'm kind of a networking guy too, and I like network engineers a lot. I think they're really nice people. As, as <laughs> <laughs> and so the network engineers want to see things look like something they can manage from the high level, right? And it's the same thing with orchestrators, it's the same thing with people um, uh, using Neutron, uh, standing up clouds, they don't want some kind of device that requires little special funny parameters that they have to do extra things in the orchestration, and particularly when it's not in their skill set to understand what those are. So I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. So. Uh, Let's go on to how, uh, how we can improve um, open vSwitch. Now, if you, look at in, uh, if you look in OVS and look at the um, install, install.dk.md, a lot of us have wanted to see this, have wanted to see this experimental go away. And I think there was an earlier attempt to submit this patch. 
and it, it didn't go anywhere. It's probably time to try again. So this led to some discussion which was interesting about ways that DPDK could be improved in order to get accepted as being non-experimental and sort of a, a, a first-class citizen within the OVS community. And, and kind of irked some people that I don't think it says experimental on the Windows data path, but that's interesting. Anyway, um, so how do we improve this? So let's, t let's talk about some of the suggestions of the thread. One of the, one of the issues, and I, I believe I, I may have glossed over this earlier, but one of the issues with uh, DPDK is the, is the device management, is the fact that uh, we have to use this NIC buying utility to disconnect the device from the Linux driver and reconnect it as a pull mode driver. That seems a little counterintuitive to, to people, um, you know, deploying OVS. Uh, there's other aspects of uh, device teardown, device bring up. People say, well, Linux does this great. The well, Linux kernel does this. Why can't you do it? But it's really not done in the Linux kernel. The network device management isn't done in the Linux kernel. It's done by these days in, in modern uh, Linux by UDEV system D brings up the devices, brings them down, and manages them. Why can't we manage, well, or maybe we should be managing uh, NetDev, TPDK net devi NetDev devices also with UDEV system D. So this suggestion actually was made by uh, Flavio Leitner, so I gotta give him credit. It's, it's just like, it seems like a really sensible approach. And then, and then there's other ideas as well. Another uh, way to improve is uh, people complain, and this is true, um, there's no way to dump packets. There's no way to say TCP dump minus I, and they give it the um, PM, DPDK PMD device driver name. Now I realize dumping packets from a 10 gigabit or 40 gigabit device is probably unrealistic, but it'd be nice to have some kind of visibility in there, and uh, like historically, like some of us and actually, Kevin's going to talk a lot more about debugging in a few minutes. But so maybe, that's one thing maybe we could do. But we need, we know how to do it, right? But we don't have the command that's available to the user it used to say like dpdk dump minus i and then an interface. But that, we could do that in OVS by mirroring, in, mirroring the packets to uh, the PMD libpcap, maybe. And then you could capture packets there, or libpcap-ng. And that's something to think about for um, those of us that are interested in submitting patches for this. Um, whoops. So for testing, uh, the one thing is the, that was discussed was to add, um, it, it, and we, in, in um, Tomas, his presentation. Uh, he talked about CI testing and some of the efforts of introducing CI testing, but um, to do d data plane testing of different devices would increase the confidence that people have of, of DPDK. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just it's a, it's a pretty broad, um, uh, what you call target, test target to, to, to deal with. Um, another uh, is projects like VSPerf. Uh, and another thing that kind of, this is just like a net that uh, some people come in is the supporting of two different types of vhost devices, vhost coos and vhost user. And people try to make vhost coos go away, but we can't seem to make it go away, um, even though it doesn't work very well. And the uh, the vhost user is really more universal and it's easier to configure and doesn't require this funny um, socket and <laughs> it's it from a, a, a person trying to trying to provision a device it's I don't know how you would use vhost coos if you're trying to provision it via um, <coughs> um, you know vsdb or something like that but you can do it with it but with vhost user pretty much looks like any other device um, Better, better documentation. Now there was, a, I think Kevin just submitted a patch to install the dpdk.md, which really clarifies things quite a bit. And, and there's been other efforts as well. And another thing is training or a tool that would somehow, that might 
um, do an LS topo type picture of your architecture in your um, in your server or wherever you're running, and and automatically instead of going, oh, see, I got this NUMA node and this core here and that core there, and just somehow compiling all that information and then um, generating EAL options uh, or whatever out of that EAL option options and socket mem options for DPDK to help make that invisible. It might not ca catch every case, but might give uh, users, as I call them, a better shot at trying to optimally use DPDK in their open vSwitch instance. And I think I'm about ready to turn it over to Kevin. And if you have any questions for me, or you, you know, you go ahead. Otherwise, we'll answer uh, questions in the end, and, and uh, Kevin can, can proceed. OK, thanks, Tom. OK, so I guess uh, Thomas talked about usability. Mark talked about architecture. So we'll talk a little bit about performance now. So I guess you know, what kind of things can we do to make sure we get you know, better and best performance in, in OVS with DPDK? So we're going to hit just a little bit of basic system tuning, some scaling out that we can do in OVS with DPDK. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the code optimizations that are ongoing. OK, so just to give an example packet flow, um, we have a case here in the, in the red where we have packets coming in through a physical port, being switched in OVS, going through a virtual port, maybe vhost user, up to the VM, there's some packet processing happens there, and they come back down, switched again in OVS, and sent out to the physical port. So by default, in this case, we're going to have a lot of stuff running on core zero. So you know, by default, the operating system will schedule some stuff there. Um, our VM processing, so our vCPUs might be pinned, they might run some stuff on core zero. You know, hopefully we wouldn't get the, the actual packet processing and forwarding, but we probably would on core zero. Um, and then on OVS, so you know, we're going to be doing a couple of things here. We're going to be trying to pull packets from the physical port, figure out where they need to go, and then send them on their way. And similarly, on the virtual, from virtual port one, we get, we're going to get packets, look them up, see where they need to go. So, <coughs> There's a lot of packet processing going on. You know, we want this to go as fast as possible, and we're really going to suffer because Core Zero is going to be completely overloaded. So, you know, luckily for us, there's, there's things we can do. So, if we start a basic system tuning, so I mean, we can isolate the, you know, use the ISOL CPUs in the kernel command line. So we can say, you know, you know, the operating system, you can use that Core Zero. You know, we'll use the other cores for switching and VMs. So we can pin our, we can core affinitize, I guess, our vCPU in QMU. So we can pin that on a particular core. So we pick core nine. So you know, keep that out of the equation for switching. So what we've done here is, we've put four cores for OBS, and we've made each one of them responsible for an individual port. So so rather than the case of our, you know, in the previous slide where we had you know one core and it was trying to service four ports, we now have a, a core per port. So that way, you know, if we're trying to read packets from physical port zero, you know, virtual port zero is not, you know, there's no packets building up there, we're not waiting to service it. Okay, and I mean, in this kind of, in this kind of scenario, like four ports, uh, four cores would be ideal. But of course, we might want to give four cores for forwarding in the switch. So, you know, obviously you could scale it down and put two cores or put one core. Uh, you know, and that, and that kind of thing can be dynamically changed even as packets are in flight. So it's very pro programmable. OK, so the next thing is, um, so I've picked core 1, 11, and 2, and 12. Can anybody hazard a guess why I picked those core numbers? Yeah, OK. Yeah, well, well, I didn't really tell you what the system would look at, like, so it was a bit of a trick question. But you're right, that's what I was thinking, hyper-chatting. So. So I was thinking that this was a you know a single socket, um, ten core uh, part, but we enabled hyperthreading. So hyperthreading you know is running two logical cores on one physical core, and for an application like OVS where it kind of scales well with cores, it's really you know free performance, a free performance boost I guess. So so I picked so so yeah so one and eleven are thread siblings. So these logical cores core one and core eleven both run on the same physical core, and similarly with 12, 2 and 12. You know, and 
we'll see later on the performance boost from hyperthreading, but um, you know it, it gives us a good a good boost. Okay, so at this stage we could look at OVS and say, well, in this scenario we have a corp report. You know we can't really get any better than that. If we had a fifth core, what's it going to do? But we can actually scale better through queues. Okay, so multiple queues makes for you know, better scaling out of performance and much more cluttered and difficult to explain diagrams. But we'll, we'll take that trade off. Um, okay, so we've had the concept of, say, you know, cores, pulling packets from ports, and then you know, looking them up and forwarding them on their way. But what about if we could split the traffic from that port into multiple queues and then assign cores to those queues. And that's what we can do. And again, it's a simple command line on the OVS, um, using OVS app control to do that. So in the physical case, that's already there. The code is upstreamed and it's using receive side scaling from the NIC. Uh, on the virtual case, so what I'm showing here is not fully upstreamed yet. So at the moment, you know, even if we did scale it on the physical ports, we come in and we have a choke point on vhost user going up to up to the guest, and that's because we have single queue for um, vhost user. But there's you know there's been great work done by the DPDK community, the OVS community, and the QMU community to enable multi queue into vhost. And I mean you would have seen there's patches on the well all three mailing lists, and I think it just needs a bit of maybe coordination between projects, maybe some testing. And hopefully we'll get there in the next release or two of you know, DPDK and QMU. Okay. So in terms of actual, so that's the kind of uh, system level tuning and scaling out. But what about actually you know, making the code itself faster? So if we didn't want to give OVS that many cores and we just wanted to you know, make things faster on a single core. So in order to understand the optimizations, I guess it's important to understand, well, what, what things are we actually doing in that pack of flow? So what can we optimize? So I guess, you know, we would we typically, we'd, we'd receive packets from the a virtual or physical NIC. You know, then Mark talked about the different tables. So we would look up um, in a series of tables, depending on, you know, what, what entries were in there, and try and find a match for that packet. And then we'd, any, act, any actions, you know, we'd need to execute, we'll do, and then we'll uh, transmit it on a virtual or a physical NIC. So ideally we want to hit in the exact match cache, you know, and this is going to give us our fastest performance. Um, if we don't, we're going to pay a performance penalty in throughput, you know, if we go up to the wildcard classifier, the data pack classifier. And again, I guess the OF proto tables, typically they'd be just the first packets in the flow should hit those tables. So we definitely don't want to go anywhere near this. We ideally want to keep stuff in here, but maybe some things will go into this depending on, on, on if stuff gets evicted out of the exact match cache. Okay, so we've an RX cost, we've a cost of lookup, which is variable depending on what table we hit. We've an action cost, and we've a TX cost. Okay. So some of the efforts that I guess are ongoing in the DPDK and OBS communities, you know, some of them have been done, some of them are in progress to make things faster. So for the physical I.O., so we offload the hash that we use in the lookup to the NIC. Okay, so that, you know, we don't need to recalculate that hash in software. Um, multiple queues, I guess that's more of a scaling out thing. That's, uh, that's done for the physical part. Um, so the use of the vectorization functions in the PMDs, so this, this to me is an interesting one. Tom talked about the usability and being able to use APIs. So, so I like this one because you know, it gave us a performance boost when we got the settings right to, to make sure that we had vectorization turned on and we, it maybe bumped us a million or two million packets per second. And that's great, but the other thing is we got really good feedback on the OVS mailing list because it made the code an awful lot simpler. So I mean, the patch for that was to remove this list of custom configs and replace it in the port, the, the TX and the RX port configs with null, okay? So let the PMD decide what the default should be. If we want to change them, you know, we can do that, but you know, why, why should OBS try and pick the defaults? Let, mm. let, the, let the PMD do it. You know, and I know for like, there's many people here, you know, 
the dream of Rx free thresholds and what the ideal values are, but from an OBS perspective, you know, people don't really care. Bruce is laughing, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, they don't really care, and you know, this can look like a lot of magic numbers. So I think it's a really good example where a simple change that I think came in and maybe around DPDK 1.8 made OBS. I suppose I'm saying usable, but I'm talking about from a, a developer of a, an application using uh, <coughs> DPDK. Okay, so the exact match cache. So I mean, the first thing we did was, well, you know, we want to try and get as many flow hits in here as possible, so just make it bigger. Okay, that's gonna help. Um, so why not make it a million entries? Well, you know, then you run into other issues with, you know, your, your cache sizes and stuff. Uh, we looked at integrating one of the DPDK hash tables, but there's a kind of a different usage model at the moment, and, and actually the, the actual the hash table in OVS is actually quite efficient as well. So um, it, it, can, it can have variable key sizes, so slightly kind of different usage models, but that might be something we look at it again in the future. Um, so there's also, you know, before we get to the EMC, there's extracting the kind of flow from the packets and the metadata. And that's something that we're working on to try and optimize because there's a bit of a bottleneck there. Uh, so the data pack classifier, so you know, we've looked at the use, and we are looking at the use of the DPDK ACL uh, tables. Um, they give much faster reads than the one that's currently in OVS. But I guess, again, it's kind of a, there's a lot of rebuilds in OVS, so we need to figure out how we can manage that and how we can integrate them, but that's, that's work in progress. On the virtual side, um, there's been a lot of work. So, so you know, we've concentrated on the, the vhost library and in particular vhost user. Um, so I guess when you're going up to the guest vhost user, you have the, the vhost library, which is the kind of host part, and the vertio PMD, which is the guest part. So you know, typical kind of DPDK type optimizations in vhost library, you know, like the prefetching, bulk allocation, and also then an OVS. So Okay, that's you know, that's fine. That's in the library. But from an OVS perspective, you know, do we need to lock and update our stats every time we call it, or can we do something different? So kind of the the code in OVS you know, surrounding like the likes of the vhost inq and vhost dq functions. Uh, the vertio PMD vectorization. I'm looking for Huawei Z. So he's been doing some great work. Um, I'm trying to see what he could do with vectorization in the Vertio PMD. So this is the kind of the guest side of the of that path up to the guest, um, and he's also put some you know some optimization ideas really for the Vertio protocol up on the mailing list. You know, so check that out if that's of interest. Uh, and again, multi queue vhost is something that you know hopefully will will land pretty soon. And I guess yeah, you could argue that's kind of more scaling out thing. So it's just a five tuple hash, and it would be used in the lookup. So it's. This is the five tuple. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so the five tuple would. Okay. So that's that's a good point. So the five tuple hash would be used to index um, the hash table, okay. but then when you do index the hash table, you would compare. You would have a like a, a greater detail. You could we would compare the flows. So you would compare other, you know other things like port numbers and stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that, that's okay. So, so at the moment, so, so that gets back to the, I guess the, the multi queue vhost. So at the moment, it's done by locking, okay, because it's only a single queue into the into the guest. So that's that has to be done by locking. Um, but you know, the, the patches are out for multi queue, um, and I'd hope that that would you know give a kind of a parallel path so we can avoid locking. Okay, so some results. Okay, so this is all upstream code. Um, it doesn't count anything that's kind of in progress at the moment. Okay, so we have two scenarios here. It's a bit hard to read. I'll call it in. Okay, so we've one that's just you know physical into OBS and back out again. So it doesn't necessarily seem like a particularly useful um, use case. But really what we're doing is we're putting really fast I.O. on it. We're sending packets in. 
and we're really kind of exercising the cost of the lookups, the flow extractions, and you know actions. So you know with standard OVS, I'll call it out in case anyone can't see at the back. It's about 1.3 uh, million packets per second, and I mean you can see there's a significant advantage with with OVS with DPDK hitting 16.5. Um, and that's just one core forwarding in the in OVS. So the, the orange block at the top, which I didn't give a legend so you wouldn't know, is a uh, is it 19.6 million packets per second, and that's the additional bump that we get from using uh, hyperthreading. So again, that would be still using one physical core for the packets forwarding in the in OVS or DPDK, but we'd be using two logical cores. Okay, so the other case then, so phi to VM, so kind of like the case we looked at in the earlier example, where we push packets into the physical port, up to the guest and back out again. Um, so standard OVS, 0 0.8. Uh, OVS with DPDK, one physical core, 4.8 million packets per second. Um, you know, and I hope that would increase with some of the optimization that's ongoing. You know, and we can see then, it, you know, it's, you know it's, this was actually a bi-directional test. And we can see that it scales really well with a second core, so a second physical core, and it jumps up, you know, pretty much, you know, as you'd expect. And again, the orange blocks are, you know, what happens when we get a hyper-treading. Okay. That's it on performance, so Tom is going to talk. So, in conclusion, we, we really look at it Let's talk about, or think about, the the, the trade-offs between um, traditional networking with a Linux kernel with Open vSwitch and networking with DPDK, and see that there's there's a trade-off, um, and that's what we're going to illustrate here. This is a, a balance, not a catapult. Uh, <laughs> so if we we look at. Uh, you know, L3 forwarding performance is vastly, vastly improved. Um, and, and, and then we have uh, the ability, ease of debugging. <laughs> On the other side, in this example, we're looking at GDP. And the goal is to get something that it just works, something that's intuitively straightforward for, for users. And we add the um, orchestration from the cloud. I, I'm sorry, we had uh, the, the different use cases. And we had the uh, stability of, uh, of uh, gaining port statistics. And we really, and we tend to have a more, uh, perhaps a balanced picture. And it's just an idea of illustrating that there's a trade-off between function functionality and performance and hopefully as we move forward we'll become we'll come to the optimum here and that is pretty much it we, we have some other interesting uh, tidbits and if you have any questions uh, I ask so what about the TCP performance um, well have you measured the TCP performance? Because this is a mixed uh, traffic with uh, huge packets and small packets, so it might be different uh, gain, or maybe not a gain at all. There might not be a gain at all. That's right. And the TCP, the way, um, and from my previous life, um, I know, and then I think many of us know, but perhaps this is a little bit of a controversial statement. The thing about TCP is once you have a stream established, on a fast networking interface, the, the Linux kernel really, really, really optimizes that TCP path. And that we're, uh, uh, we're, we've looked at and we're getting the pressure for the, for the highest gains is on UDP and small packet sizes. Yes, Stephen. You have a, uh, there, you will see a fundamental problem right now, which is that the vhost and the vertio both don't implement the features in vertio to do checksum offload, oh, yeah. and that will cause an actual performance drop um, in some workloads. I can do some tests between our DPDK-based 
and our non-DB older non-DBDK based product, and I'll see some sub cases where the older product has better performance, and that is strictly due to the lack of TCP offload and, and segmentation offload. Yeah, yeah, that that makes sense, and that's probably a better answer. Uh, the right, so you're in comparing the Linux kernel data plane with the DPDK data plane. Because the Linux, the Linux kernel. It's really down in the, the not in the data plane. You really, the, the the blame goes down to the device driver right. and the feature bits that get negotiated. Right, and what users see is they we don't we don't optimize those capabilities of those devices, so people blame it on the data plane. Well, one thing we want to do is we want to try and get some of that offloaded to the, the NIC. Yeah. So yeah. The but you really want feature parity. Yeah, absolutely. You want if there's a, if you know, BLS, QAMU, latest version supports these feature bits, then we need to have that in the DPDK. And another good example, too, uh, that is uh, VLAN handling. Um, you know, VLAN pop, pop pushing and popping is, is, uh, is accelerated in just about every NIC out there um, in, in real life. And, you know, as we, uh, uh, you know, working in Q and Q in the Linux kernel, um, OVS data path. And so that's something we need to take a look at as well. But it's a very good point. Ah, yes. Wait, he's wait for the mic because I'm over here. Could, could you repeat the question? We, with the initial IVSH mem model, there was a logic to have a complete zero copies between the us and the guests. So, what would be the approach uh, with OVS DPK? Yeah, why don't you? Basically, oh, you don't need this, that's right. <laughs> he needs so, initially, the first kind of implementation of OVS. Uh, DBDK with IV shared memory was like that. You just share it and you don't really worry about it. We did do some work in the DBDK project maybe a year ago or a year and a bit ago where rather than share entire memory regions like an entire page up to the guest, we, we would share just individual objects. So you could share a ring or a membuff, uh, embuff pool or something like that to kind of do a little bit more isolation. Um, you can kind of see that maybe the next step to that would be uh, to allow some kind of security zone, so some uh, virtual machines that want to talk between each other, zero copy, could do so, whereas other ones who don't, you maybe have to introduce a copy to get uh, better security. But at the moment, um, the, we really only have basic support in OVS uh, with DVDK, so it, it's just sharing a page up to, to the virtual machine, and, and that's mainly because I think vHost has proved to be quite a successful model, and we're getting a lot more traction with with users and customers to use that. However, there, there's there's still an option to use IV shared memory, I guess, if people want to take up the, the work and trying to get that working better. Does that answer your question, Vincent? Yeah. Any other have you measured uh, the number of the setup connections or the rules per second uh, in your configuration comparing to kernel? Mm as in the flow setup time? Yes. Uh, we haven't done it a lot. There are some papers out there you can see that um, VMware have d deployed Open vSwitch in their data centers and they kind of show how many, in typical use cases, how many s flow setups they get per second, you know, before they introduce megaflows and after they uh, introduce megaflows. However, the number should be the same for DBDK as compared to uh, without DBDK. Um, but the time taken, and that could be the other thing you're talking about, to actually do that up call is obviously less because you don't have a contact switch from kernel space to user space, so there is an advantage there. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. So there is a project in OPNFE, the VS Perf project. Um, I don't think there's anyone from that project here, but uh, the, the intention of that is to characterize a lot of these perform these metrics for different switches, and that's actually one of them, the, the amount of time it takes to establish a flow in a, in a switch. And, and, and that's a good point. I'll get to your question, Vincent, but um, like Mark said, there's also another project in OPNFE called OVS for OPNFE, and where we're gonna deploy alternately either an OVS with a DPDK accelerated data plan to be used by the virtual functions or one without. And then the vSperf will be able to measure the difference at that point. It's, uh, 
one of many things that we hope we hope to, to help accomplish. And with all these optimizations which are done in OVS, and how does that run on the other CPUs like ARM CPUs, MIM CPUs, and, and others? I mean, because I know there are some OVS ODP, for instance, or OVS ODP. Came. I don't want to open that topic, but ODP, but I'd like to understand the core of OVS, all the optimization which are done. What are the positive or negative impacts it can have on, on all the CPUs? So I work for Intel, so I've never actually done that. <laughs> I'd be interested if someone else's maybe run it on ARM. Um, it's it's probably a similar discussion to you know DBDK running it on ARM or, or Intel. But I don't know. That, have you guys at Red Hat? I can, I can, I can answer uh, shortly now. Basically, all the recommendations that are mentioned here are basically applied to other platforms like ARM. Because Yeah, and just one thing I want to point out is also some of the optimizations like our, like that, like say Huawei has suggested our protocol, op, you know, optimization. So they would be really, you know, chip agnostic. 